Concordance. Were we justified in having Eric and Sai on the program? Well, I, I think what what's funny is how many people think that we brought them on to somehow convince them. Uh, <laughs> that was never the intention. Uh, if Sai changes, reverse, reverses his position, he's not the person I think he is. Uh, the point was to bring out the issues, and I think my goal was to bring out the counter apologetic because you know clearly Sai showed up with a camera and a, a motivation uh, to the reason rally and he did ambush interviews and, and I thought you know let's give him a chance to come on and uh, say his piece to a more prepared group you know rather than in a social setting showing up with uh, shoving a camera in someone's face you know let's let's have an honest discussion of course it turned out not to be an honest discussion i think we all knew it wasn't going to be hi sai and you know i'd be willing to have a one on one with sai except i don't think there's really any point there's there's no neutral ground for either one of us to stand on his arguments are obviously specious we we highlighted that rather elegantly and i thought you know there was a lot of technical issues it was a, a bit of a free for all at times but um, the purpose in my mind was to highlight the arguments and where either side rests on the position that's that was my whole goal well i i i would agree with that um particularly as this is a new style of argument that seems to be getting uh, more popular and i think that a lot of uh, atheists are not familiar with it so i think that for those that are not to see it aired and to see some potential counter arguments was probably useful thunder yeah, I mean, it's, it's been pointed out to me, this is sort of just a, an, an amusing thing. Uh, so, Satan, if you say it quickly enough, uh, sounds, uh, uh, how shall I say, phonetically amusing. So it was interesting to have Satan on the uh, the Magic Sandwich show. And uh, yeah, for me, it can always be brought down, down to this one one line that if you're willing to be dishonest about your position, Yes, you can have absolute certain. If you're willing to, if you if you're constrained by being honest about your position, no, you can't have absolute certainty. Going back to their argument, um, it seems to me that, uh, and this is something I mentioned very briefly to Sai. It seems almost like it's an act of cowardice, because what they are doing is they're saying, "I refuse to talk to you unless." you accept my position. And this came up when we were trying to talk about the contents of the Bible. And he says, no, I'm not talking about that because you're not accepting my position. Isn't that, do you think that that is cowardice? It's a get out clause for them? They don't have but to the deal with the issues? The crazy thing is, uh, yeah, I've since gone over, uh, uh, used several of their videos, and it's a point they make again and again. In fact, I tried to bring it up actually during the show, but it got lost in the uh, plots and jets. And, uh, that they're always making this thing about First Peter 3.15, that you should always be willing to give an answer, or always be ready to give an answer. And Sai, at several times, just refused point blank to discuss um, the Bible. Um, and I, I think, um, with good reason, because it's sort of pretty indefensible stuff. But I mean, if if you adopt their position, you you avoid having to deal with any of the contents of the Bible, any of its contradictions, any of its immoral messages, uh, any of its scientific inaccuracies, um, because all of those, if you accept their presuppositional position, are explained away. And this is why I think it is, it, it's, is it the last bastion of a scoundrel that they're they're taking with this position because they've been defeated on every every other argument concordance yeah they're really they haven't ever been a truly convincing apologetic or we wouldn't all be here we wouldn't all be uh not in church right now we, <laughs> we obviously are, are not easily persuaded and and we're people who value reason we we evaluate arguments we change our minds that's one of the things that i i like most about our group um, we're prepared to follow the evidence ruthlessly, whichever way it, it may lead. And, and that, that to me, is the most fundamental difference between apologetics and science. I, I think I've said this before, but it's so fundamental that apologetics are coming up with uh, excuses for why things 
aren't the way we would think they would be or trying to explain things to people uh, in light of a particular philosophical position. And science is really the exact opposite. And a lot of philosophy is the exact opposite. And that is we take the empirical facts and we try to draw conclusions from them. In other words, we, we start from observation and work our way to conclusion. Whereas apologetics start from conclusion and try to find facts to support it. And it, it's the, the flow of knowledge is so backwards between those two movements um, that really no matter what, you always find that underlying any kind of an apologetic argument is selective acceptance. You're accepting this, but you're rejecting that. And if you see that in, say, HIV denialism, that's how you know that they've lost the plot, that, that they're no longer doing science anymore. It's because they've decided HIV doesn't exist or HIV doesn't cause AIDS. Therefore, let us find the evidence that that is true. So they start from the wrong end of the equation from my point of view. And I would just really chime in with that and say, if you start with this, I have absolute knowledge and it is absolutely and utterly impossible for me to be wrong, then you can never advance beyond the knowledge that you currently have. And if that's limited to the Bible, um, you don't have to think about it long and hard to realize that this would, would cripple civilization. But I mean, the other the sort of thing that is fairly obvious is successful um, apologetics are successful, and this one is obviously not a successful apologetic. Otherwise, um, this is how Abraham would have started on day one. That oh, by the way, logic exists, and there. In fact, it's it's not even I think, therefore I am. It's God, therefore I am, um, and it's. It's just not a very convincing argument. Um, and if it were, we would see more of it. But there's not even a hint of it. You don't get it with the Old Testament. You don't get it with the New Testament. Um, and and now is, all of a sudden... This is what I'm saying, Thunder. I think that we're going to hear more of this because I think um, a lot of theists will probably cling on to this um, because, um, it, because it's, it's, it's such a wonderful position for them to take. It's basically, no, you agree with me or I don't discuss it with you. Now, let, let me tell you the way that I... Uh, you might be right that we'll see more of it, but not for, I think, the reasons that, that you're thinking. And I would, I would um, rather obscurely go to the Newfoundland fish stocks in that when they were... The Newfoundland fish stocks were decimated and they, they fished out all the uh, breeding fish, and it, it'll, it's not going to ever recover. But the interesting thing is, as they fished out more and more of the fish, um, and you know, the scientists were there sort of saying, stop fishing now, you're decimating the population, uh, you're going to cause irreconcilable differences. The fisherman was coming back and saying, but the fish catches are bigger, better than ever. And they were, because as you actually get more and more of the fish out, the shoals that form are bigger and den the, the were bigger and denser. Um, yeah, to the point where the the last catch that you get is 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 the biggest. But really, what you're looking at is these are um, the hardcore. All the sensible people have long since left. Um, by the time you get down to the people who will be convinced by. Um, if you don't have the Christian God, then you can't have logic, you can't have science, you can't have emotions or anything. I, I don't think anyone who is not a Christian would be convinced by that as an argument. I, I, I would obviously agree with you, but um, again, for those that are facing this argument perhaps for the first time, um, what is the best sort of defense that can be, or argument that can be posed uh, against them. I, I think there are um, a couple of absolute blinders. That uh, the the, the best one is just to get let them come on and talk. Well, no. Um, no, no, spot, so, sunlight is the best stand for this sort of thing. Well, no, because they're, they're, they're well rehearsed and, you know, they can be convincing uh, to someone um, who perhaps it's not oh come on i mean the most obvious thing is the they, point they that you, up, you, you made again and again that all right let's just assume that you're right on everything 
uh, why the Christian God rather well, than well, Cthulhu sorry, you've, or you've Big Forest or thunder. Magic Vegetable or what? Yeah, you stole my thunder, Thunder. In my view, there were um, three very good arguments against them. Firstly, as you rightly say, why is it the Christian God? Now, when that question was posed to Sai and Eric, they basically said, well, you know, we're on an atheist podcast and you're not coming here suggesting that there's another God, so I'm not going to discuss that with you. Wonderful way to avoid it. But why is it the Christian God? That's, that's argument number one. The second one, I think, um, personally anyway, I think it's very, very straightforward. It's, anyone can grasp this. They argue that without their presuppositional position, logic, the law of uniformity and everything, all of that would not exist. But their God performs miracles which completely blows um, the law of uniformity and yeah. uh, whatever. And just, just to put this all into perspective, you know, I was just doing the, so one of the miracles that uh, Satan um, quoted was God stopping the earth. And here you do some back of the envelope calculations and the energy expenditure to do this was comparable to the mass of the earth in high explosive. That's about the amount of energy that's actually stored in in the earth rotating. Um, and so that the, there are these sort of gross violations of things like conservation of energy. And in the self same breath, they'll say that the the universe is wonderfully uniform, and we know that it's wonderfully uniform because God keeps it so. Apart from when He doesn't. I mean, that's what makes these things so sort of content free statements. And that's it. If if their God, which is obviously the Christian God, the God of the Bible, is performing miracles by His nature, He does. And 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 Sai's comment on this was, well, I've got an expectation that what will happen tomorrow will be the same as what happened yesterday because God only stopped the earth rotating once. I, I mean, I'm sorry. There was a third argument which is about the subjective nature of um, uh, of God's commands which um, Concordance dealt with. Um, do you want to just summarize that for us as I bring in the first caller concor Concordance? Yeah, so I, I, I'll talk about that in a sec, but I think there are the three approaches. There's simply avoiding, uh, or not avoiding, but walking away, because it's a, it's a juvenile argument. It's meant to be a gotcha argument. Um, and this is what I, I, I would like to say to Sai, is, is unless there's neutral ground, there's no point in trying to have a discussion. And that's what you get from PZ Myers, and that's what you get from James Randi. When you ambush them with a camera with a stupid argument that you pester them with, they're not going to take it seriously, and they're not going to respond, because it's not a, it's not a worthwhile question. Uh, but you can also go with the, how do you know it's your particular God? I think that's a loser, personally. I think that's not the argument you want to make. The third argument is that either your God in particular is subject to these laws, in which case she can't have invented them, or she is subject to these laws, in which case she's not the God described in the Bible, right? So it's a self-defeating argument. Either you've got something that's logically incoherent, scientifically inconsistent, that can suspend the laws of motion, that can decide that a rock is not a rock, or you've got a being who is constrained by physics and time, which is not what's described in your book and what you assert, you know, all loving, all, all powerful uh, being. Outside of space and time, what does it mean to be outside of space and time? And How what's would you more, think? And what's more, none of these properties are in the Bible. No, then, no one mentions that God is logical in the Bible. No one mentions that he's um, outside space and time, intangible, and all these other things. These are just um, you know, fluff words that people have invented to obfuscate the issue. Um, and the usual one they use is that it's part of God's character. Well, you know, if God's got a character, does God have a character like I have a character in that I can act out of character? So can God do that, or am I better than God in this attribute? Yeah, and this it, is if something I, I, I so agree with you, Thunder, and this is something that I'm going to be addressing in um, the next video I do um, in the God is Not Good series. When Sai was asked, would it be morally correct to molest a child if God told you to? 
And he said, God would never do that because it's not in his nature. And it's like, this is projection. This is your projection onto your imaginary friend. How do you know what God's character is like? How can you well, say, even, oh, well, he's all good and therefore he wouldn't demand such a thing? What he has done. Well, even beyond yeah. that, though, if, if, if God decides what is moral, I, now we're back to the, your thrift pros dilemma. It, it's, the, the point is either God is good because God has decided that this is good, and so we're all sort of subject to these, these whims, uh, and therefore there really are no absolute or objective morals. Or God is subject to something else. Let's call him super God, right? Super God exists, and super God has properties. And, and that's what we're talking about. You know, the old story about the woman, you know, asking her, you know, the flat disc, and it sits on top of the backs of turtles who stand, or backs of uh, elephants, and they stand on a turtle. And they ask the lady, what, what's the turtle standing on? And she says, no, you can't fool me. It's turtles all the way down. Right. That's yeah. that's the kind of thing we're dealing with. Are these recursive uh, uh, dilemmas where y you can't resolve it, and and somehow, <laughs> Cy thinks he's got to well, get actually, out of jail free um, card. In relation to William Lane Craig, he does quite specifically. Um, it's a part of the footage that I used that wasn't actually in the video, but will be in the next one. Don't worry. He actually relies on a divine a divine command theory or right. whatever. Basically, he he takes the view that whatever God says is morally right. And I think he therefore puts himself in a very awkward position, a position which I hope to highlight in the next video. But basically, he's, he's then stuck with having to try and justify all the atrocities that God has done by saying, well, you know, if he says it's okay to do it, then it's okay to do it. Then God's morality is nothing like it is purported to be, and it is not good, and it's not well, not good by any measure that we would uh, would assess it by. That well, and more than that, how, where does where does God's nature come from? God didn't create His own nature, so God's nature is arbitrary, random. Uh, you know, is it derived from the universe? Is it derived from non-spaced? I mean, think about what what does it mean to have a non-created being? who is eternal, but has properties, has characteristics or a nature, right? Now you're, now you're borrowing from uh, a, a naturalist or an atheist worldview, oh. and you're simply substituting God in place of uh, evolution and nature and, you know, all the things around us that we observe. We assume that God has a nature, just like we assume that a rock has a nature, right? Where did that come from? Who created it? What, 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 Gives that nature to God, and and there's no answer. Thunder. And what's more, well, yeah, I mean, what what's more, uh, you take a look at the properties they typically assign to God, things like loving, caring, faithful. They're all interpersonal uh, attributes. Now think about it. If you are all on your own in the in the universe, what the hell does love mean? Yeah, you know, the the. It, it's it's a redundant concept. It's like you know, if you're all alone on a desert island, um, can you steal anything? Is stealing immoral if there is no one else around to own anything? And so, uh, a lot of these um, attributes that they project onto God uh, are clearly very human attributes that you wouldn't necessarily, well, in fact, I wouldn't expect a God to have. I think what you, when you said they're human attributes, exactly, because right. God is man-made and he's only going to have the attributes that human imagination can give to him. I note that Aaron has just come online, so we may be being joined by him uh, in uh, a few moments, but let's introduce the first uh, caller, uh, Spiny, Spiny Norman. Uh, 